Well, good afternoon and welcome to this month's Dean's Research Seminar. I'm Professor John Fazakli, Dean of the Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural Sciences, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this month's Dean's Research Seminar. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I'm on today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, as well as the traditional owners of the land you're situated on, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and also acknowledge the role of Indigenous knowledge in our academy. Today, Professor Giovanni Turchini will present the Dean's lecture, Aquaculture and the Omega-3 Shortage. Professor Turchini completed his master's in animal sciences in 1999 and his doctorate in food quality in 2003, both in the Faculty of Veterinary Sciences at the University of Milan in Italy. He moved to Australia to the School of Ecology and Environment at Deakin University in 2006, progressing there to a full professor in nutrition and food science in 2018, and in 2019 to associate dean for research in Deakin's largest faculty. In May this year, Gio joined us as head of the School of Agriculture and Food. As a biochemist and nutritionist, his research interests span animal and human nutrition, aquaculture, food and feed, quality and technologies, seafood sustainability, and ethics in the fisheries and aquaculture sectors. He has a particular interest in lipids, fatty acids, and omega-3 metabolism in cultured aquatic species, and we'll hear something about that today. Professor Takini has an international reputation in his field. He was awarded the Nutrition Society of Australia Medal in 2014 for his outstanding record in the field of animal and human nutrition and the inaugural Australasian Aquaculture Award in 2012. He's been the recipient of two ARC Discovery Fellowships and has secured competitive grants and industry collaborations, totaling over 6.7 million. He's regularly invited to speak at conferences and symposia. He's editor in chief of Reviews in Aquaculture, the highest impact factor journal in the fisheries sector. And he has over 150 publications in refereed journals with over 7,000 citations and an H index of 47. I'm delighted that Professor Giovanni Tacchini Gio has joined our faculty as head of the School of Agriculture and Food, and that he's agreed at this early point in his new role to talk about some of his research. Gio, over to you. Thanks, John, and good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I will start by sharing my screen. Hopefully, you can see that now. So I can uh, cover an area of research that has been very important for me in the last 15 years and is about the relation between aquaculture and the omega-3 fatty acids. So in the graph here you can see the production of uh, landing of wild caught fish, so fisheries production from the 70s till nowadays and as you can see about in the 90s start reaching a plateau and became quite stable. During the same time, aquaculture had an incredible growth from basically very little to overtaking the total volume of wild fisher in 2012. <clears throat> and oh, I, I admit this data is a little bit old. I didn't have the time to update it, but let's say that the trend is the same with aquaculture nowadays in 2020, projected to reach 100 million tons in 2030. And wild fishery is staying stable at the level of about 80,000 million, 80 million tons. One of the issues of this situation is that some fish, particularly those small pelagic species like anchovies, sardines, or herring, a large volume of this fish is caught from the wild, converted into fish meal and fish oil, so the dried powder rich in protein and, and, and oil, put together in the shape of a pellet and then used as aqua feed, so the feed for farm fish. This clearly makes not much sense on one hand, and in fact, there's been an accusation to aquaculture of being responsible of not fixing the problem of producing more fish, but actually being possibly responsible of the destruction of the ocean, based on the assumption that if aquaculture is keep growing, it will, of course, affect the total available fish from the wild. This is the criticism that aquaculture has received. But I questioned that multiple times, and there are strong evidence to suggest that there is something not that quite obvious. First, we need to look at the total production of fish and differentiate amongst different groups of fish. There are crustaceans, freshwater fish, and seaweed, which are not used for, um, uh, for aquafeed. 
And so we don't need to consider them. And within the 70% of them, the wild marine fish, about 40% are used directly for human consumption. And then about 30% are used for the production of this raw material, fish meal and fish oil. So if we just look at the production of fish meal and fish oil, and their conversion into fish meal and fish oil, which is much smaller volume, because of course we remove all the water when we dry them in fish meal and fish oil, we can see that there's been a constant production, about 5 million tons of fish meal and 1 million tons of fish oil. And if we look back up to the 1950, it was the same amount. So aquaculture has been growing <clears throat> and it's about 90 million tons and going up from basically zero in the 70s. And the criticism is still there, say aquaculture by using fish meal and fish oil is responsible for depleting the ocean. However, it is clear to me that if you look at the trend, that's not the case. The amount of fish meal and fish oil that has been harvested from the ocean has been absolutely constant. So the issue here is not an issue of sustainability, but is a different issue. The issue is based on one of the fundamental law of economics. There is an increasing demand for a product and there is a constant limited supply, which means the obvious result is a constantly increasing price of these resources. With fish oil reaching the 2000 tons per, uh, $2,000 per tons and fish meal about 1.4. This is a serious issue. It is an issue of economic sustainability of the sector and not really much a problem of environmental sustainability. So anyway, the, the, the narrative around the world and the major criticism about aquaculture is still about this concern, which is not really substantiated, about the use of this uh, wild caught fish. So environmental concerns are extremely important. And I, I, did, I presented this a few years ago in a conference and I tried to uh, decide on an arbitrary scale, if we put on a y-axis the environmental concern over time, I wanted to see how different stakeholders respond to this. And the public, uh, in my view, has a, a trend like this. There is a big spike of concern that fades down until there is another big one. Public, which then means, of course, the retailing sector, and in a way also the regulator. Why we have these spikes? These spikes are typically coming as a result of media release after scientific paper, or TV show, or even books bad-mouthing aquaculture. It seems like a national sport to speak very badly about aquaculture. Some of these scientific paper are actually published by the top journal, like Science and Nature. Every three, four years, they typically send out a message saying that aquaculture is destroying the world because it uses fish meal and fish oil. And then all the cascade, there's no ball effect on public perception. Other stakeholders are raw material producer. And the trends I observed are these two. In particular, the red line is for the producer of alternative raw material. For example, soybean meal producer, they consider environmental concern of use of fish meal and fish oil as one of the most important problem ever. While of course, fish meal and fish oil companies, they sort of try to ignore the problem. The Aquafit company, I have a trend going like this, which is fundamentally mirroring the cost of the resources. So the most expensive the resource is, the more, of course, they say they care about the environment and they cannot use fish meal and fish oil because it's not sustainable. But the reality, the driver is simply as simple as the price of these resources. And then we have academia. Academia, they have this classic trend and I've been using this trend as well. So this regular spike coming up and down, and this actually equates to the annual runs for competitive grants and funding. When we academics want some money, of course we need to sell the pitch, and we say that that practice is highly unsustainable, use of fish meal and fish oil is not sustainable, and therefore we need money to do our research. The reality is that the problem is the cost of these resources, which is far too high, and it's jeopardizing the industry. So the question that many people ask around the world is what will happen in the future? Because if aquaculture needs to expand and these resources are constant, what might happen to the future? And to answer what might happen to the future, I think it's useful to look at what did happen in the past. So I prepare a little brief history of the use of fish meal and fish oil. Everything started about in 1950, after the Second World War, uh, many fishing uh, vessels were converted into, uh, uh, sorry, fighting 
were military vessels were converted into fishing vessels. And they start catching those large volume of anchovies, particularly in the Pacific Ocean, that were there ready to be harvested. These were then converted into a dry powder and in fish meal. Initial use of this fish meal was very cheap use, like fertilizer or soil amendment, and a little bit was used also for livestock, particularly for cattle. Later on in the 70s, most of the fish meal has been used for feeding pork and poultry. And then and about in the 90s, with the expansion of aquaculture, aquaculture started becoming the bigger purchaser of fish meal. Up to nowadays, in the last 10, 10 years, aquaculture is fundamentally the only industry purchasing and using fish meal. What will happen into the future has been predicted about 10 years ago by Ron Hardy, and he was spot on. So basically, fish meal is no longer the main protein source for fish, but is a, a sort of a specialty ingredient which is added to the feed for specifically purposes like enhanced palatability or balancing dietary amino acid, amino acid and so forth. The problem is again the, uh, the, the balance between supply and demand, but the situation for fish meal seems to be relatively under control. When it comes to the fish oil, in the 1950s, the large amount of fish oil was actually used for very cheap industrial purposes, like lubricant or even for paint. A little bit was uh, hydrogenated and used for the baking industry. And then again, in the 70s, it was start being used by some animals, terrestrial animal sectors. In the 90s, fundamentally all purchased and utilized by the aquaculture sector. And in the last 10 years, something different compared to fish meal happened. What's happened is that the aquaculture is using most of it, but here aquaculture has a competitor. The competitor is the nutraceutical sector, because like fish oil tablets and so on. And so the situation for fish oil is a little bit different compared to fish meat. When we look at the projection of what will happen into the future, some has suggested that the market that will buy everything is actually going to be the nutraceutical sector and not aquaculture. And that was not actually correct because in reality, some aquaculture sectors, not all, some aquaculture sector have a need and a purchasing power, which is similar to that of nutraceutical. So they still are the largest user and they will be the largest user of fish oil. So, but why fish oil? Why fish oil is so important? Because of its unique fatty acid profile. <clears throat> Fish oil contains the long chain omega 3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, and in particular, the two most common ones are EPA and DHA. And EPA and DHA provide a lot of health benefits for humans and as well for animals. If we look at other uh, food source and where we can find these fatty acids, we, we can see that in fish we can find abundant amount of EPA and DHA. Then in seaweed, we can find high concentration of these uh, fatty acids, but they are very, very lean products. So seaweed contains very little amount of fat, and therefore the actual amount of EPA and DHA is almost trivial. In animal products, there is some EPA and DHA, like in meat, or in, there's some, but is highly diluted, and actually is much less than the omega-6. And the omega-6 fatty acids are the one responsible, that they are called pro-inflammatory, are responsible for some of the metabolic disorders. And we currently eat too much omega-6 relative to omega-3. So animal products, they contain some EPA and DHA, but they also bring far a lot of omega-6. And then very importantly, not found in any terrestrial plant or vegetable products. There's no such thing as EPA and DHA in any terrestrial plants product. There is some misunderstanding around. And in fact, I wrote a paper about that in 2012 because I received a lot of letters and complaints from people saying, stop working with fish. I can get all my omega trees fulfilled by eating walnuts, canola oil, or linseed. Well, that omega-3 that you find in plants is a different omega-3. It's a precursor for EPA and DHA, but is not EPA and DHA. That is called alpha-linolenic acid and is much shorter and less unsaturated. It still may be good for health, but is not providing the same health benefit than EPA and DHA. What is important for aquaculture is that the level of EPA and DHA in fish fillet is actually reflective to that of the diet. So if we provide fish with a lot of EPA and DHA, we harvest the fish that we can sell on the market with a lot of EPA and DHA. 
we have done some modeling uh, on that, uh, on this, and recently I published this paper, uh, which was a mega review where we analyzed basically all published work where we described the relationship between uh, fatty acid in the diet and fatty acid in the fillet that was published on progress on lipid research. Nevertheless, it's important also to remember that fish, and I will describe that later, can actually make some omega-3. And in fact, I have this objective and my aspiration is that of transforming the salmonid aquaculture industry from a consumer to a producer of long chain omega-3. And I publish in Food Chemistry, fundamentally a concept paper about that. In 2015, I was invited to give a talk to the AAOCS uh, conference that was actually held in Geelong about global long chain omega-3 supply. And at that point, i had done some calculation sort of a back of an envelope of calculation, looking at the production of different categories of uh, seafood, and then knowing the amount of EPA and DHA in each of them. And I tried to quantify the total production of EPA and DHA availability in the world. Just a note for, particularly for early career researchers, don't do that. Don't present this kind of data at a conference if you are not going to publish very soon, because in fact, there were a couple in the audience that then publish a revised version of this idea I had, and they got a lot of traction while I left with very little. Anyway, you can see that uh, we found EPA and DHA in different group of uh, seafood, all, and some of them are non-food items like fish meal and fish oil. And then I quantified the total volume. So I've done an estimate of 427,000 tons of EPA and DHA, 60% in non-food and 38% in food, which if divided by the number of day in a year and the number of people in this world equates to a 67 milligram per day per head. If we want to achieve a 500 milligram day per capita, we would need something like 75 million tons of herring and sardines. And just to give you an idea, at the moment, the production is about 1.7 million tons and is considered to be to the maximum sustainable limits or we need to put, produce 760 million tons of a generic fin fish, which about 10 times more than what the global supply is of fish from the wild and aquaculture. So the summary is that global fish and seafood production will never be able to fulfill omega-3 requirement for the humanity. There's no such thing. If we want to achieve that recommended intake of 500 milligram per day. So aquaculture, as well as the world, is actually facing, facing a substantial omega-3 shortages. And the interesting part is that the salmonid industry is the largest user of this long-chain omega-3, but at the same time is one of the largest suppliers of long-chain omega-3 for human consumption, because we take a lot of our omega-3 by eating salmon. So why fish oil in particular? The point why we need fish oil for salmon, for example, or other uh, aquatic animals. They don't really need fish oil. What they need is a highly digestible energy source. They need essential fatty acid. And well, crustaceans also need some phospholipids and cholesterol. And we have plenty of alternative options that provides energy, phospholipids and cholesterol, but the bottleneck are the long chain omega-3, EPA and DHA. If we want to provide EPA and DHA just at the bare minimum amount to satisfy the physiological requirements of fish, this is not a big problem because it, the, these minimal requirements are very little and we can expand the sector quite significantly. However, if we want to provide enough EPA and DHA in the diet of farm fish to maximize, to provide optimal growth health and not just the bare minimum, then this is start becoming a problem for some species, particularly the salmon. The biggest problem is if we want to provide enough EPA and DHA to farm fish so that then we can achieve the final product with abundant amount of these fatty acids in the fillet. So if we want to satisfy, let's say, the nutritional quality expectation of consumers, this is a big problem and is what has been attracting my attention for many years. So what are the strategies that have been started in the last 20 to 30 years to address this issue of the omega-3 shortages in aquaculture? They can be summarized in these dot points. The species selection, so selecting a species that are more efficient in the use of fish oil, or they are more efficient in making this EPA and DHA. 
the genetically modify, modification of fish, the selective breeding, and these are all working on the fish, let's say. A different approach is to look at alternative sources of long-chain omega-3. For example, krill and mesopelasic species, species, which are resources available in the ocean, which are not completely used at the moment. So there is room for expansion and harvest more oil. Or the two big one happening recently is the production of single cell oils or microalgae oils, which are microalgae that can be grown in big fermenter and then the oil can be harvested, and this oil is rich in long chain omega-3, or the genetic modification of crop. For example, here in Australia, uh, we have a genetically modified canola crop that produce large amount of DHA. In the UK, they modified, I think, camelina, and in the US, they've been trying to modify soybean with actually not big success thus far, but the camelina from UK and the canola from Australia, they are commercially available at the moment, in small quantity. And then the other two areas of interest are the in vivo on chain of biosynthetic capability of farm fish and the optimization of the utilization of this long chain. When it comes to this, uh, for example, species selection and genetically modified modif modification of fish, they have some limit, mainly they are limited by, and dictated by consumer's preference and expectation. If we ask people to stop eating salmon and to eat carp instead, it's gonna be very difficult, as well as convincing most of, of the particular Western world to eat genetically modified animals. So there is, there is some limit there. The selective breeding is an area that has attracted quite interest. There's good preliminary evidence that we can select for traits of more efficient utilization of long chain PUFA metabolism in fish. And there is some commercial action in that direction, but is a is one fix the problem, but definitely will improve the current situation. The find of alternative resource of long chain omega three is supposedly to be the game changer, but there are a series of economic and feasibility consideration. When it comes to krill and mesopelagic species, is very much simply postponing the problem. After after we harvest all the fish to make fish oil, we're going to start harvesting the krill and other species, but we're not gonna fix the problem. We simply postpone the problem of not having enough omega-3. When it comes to single cell oils and genetically modified oils, these are getting traction, particularly single cell oils. There are some large commercial producer and they are start being used into aqua feed. The problem is an economic issue here. Those producer are clearly not interested in selling their products at a cheaper price compared to fish oil, so those ingredients are coming on the market actually at a premium price, also because they have the tag of being sustainable and not unsustainable like fish oil. Therefore, these products are coming, are, have been used, but they will not fix all the problem. And I, for many years, focus a lot of my research attention on the last two points, understanding the in vivo long chain proof of biosynthetic uh, uh, situation in fish and how we can maximize or improve this production. <clears throat> and the important point here, because I'm always asked, oh, what's the solution? I don't think there is a silver bullet. There is not a single solution that will fix all the problem, but all these approaches are needed to complement each other so that we can produce fish into the future with and providing EPA and DHA to consumers. So now I go a little bit more into the metabolic aspects of a long chain PUFA. I'm sure most of you are aware with the, this pathway, which is fundamentally the bioconversion of the short omega-3 alpha linolenic acid, 18,3N3, which is the one we can find abundantly, for example, in linseed or in canola and walnut. It can be converted in vivo, even in human, but also in fish, to EPA, which is this one, 25N3, and DHA, 22,6N3. And there are a series of enzymes, the saturases and the elongase enzyme, that sort of alternate each other. The same enzyme also acts on the bioconversion of the omega-6 fatty acid. So the same enzyme makes this conversion of both. And just as a reminder, we can simplify saying that the omega-3 are the good one, health promoting. The omega-6 are the bad one, which are uh, increasing inflammation. It is quite simplistic, but let's consider like this for the moment. Some fish 
actually have the ability to bypass the spreader pathway because they have a delta say the saturase and also they have an alternative pathway here. But the situation is very much similar and this alternative pathway have been only tested and verified in vitro so far. <clears throat> so this bioconversion pathway, as I mentioned, is present in almost all vertebrates, human included. Only few animals have lost the ability of doing this bioconversion. Some top order fish, they are not able to do that, like tuna or yellowtail. Also some animal like feline, I think they've lost the ability to do that. Most cultured fish, they can. They can bioconvert 18, C18 PUFA to long chain. The question is that they don't do enough uh, for our expectation. So the problem is <clears throat> what can be done. And I've done a lot of research on try to understand what is known and how to build on that. From a genetic point of view, looking at gene transcription rate, we know that if we provide a lot of long chain PUFA in the diet of this animal, they downregulate those enzymes, which makes sense, of course. If we provide a lot of those uh, long chain PUFA, then they upregulate the enzyme transcription rate. This is still not enough to compensate for the lack of long chain omega 3. And here I just put some of the paper I published on those topics. There was something about translation I was interested to look at. I will skip it for time, but let's say the translation. So the conversion of RNA into protein hasn't been actually done properly. So I skip this quickly and I go to the substrate. What we know is that if we provide an abundant amount of alpha linolenic acid in the diet, and we look at the enzyme activity in this case, not the RNA, not the protein content, we have in an increased biosynthesis of long chain. There is some activity, but it's not efficient. So it's not enough, it's not a, a sufficient strategy to, uh, to fix the problem. And here, a few other papers from my group. There was a discussion about the fact that the delta-6 desaturase is a rate limiting. So basically the suggestion was this enzyme is what limited the bioconversion. So what we did was a study where we actually provide the fish with a large amount of SDA, steroidonic acid, which is the product of this enzyme. And the concept is if that is the rate limiting, I bypass the rate limiting, I should see a lot of EPA and DHA production. The gain we achieved was very little, fundamentally nothing. <clears throat> and therefore we conclude that there is no rate limiting uh, enzyme in the pathway. By doing this work actually, we identified that the pathway actually has a funnel-like shape till the production of EPA, and then is actually quite fast from EPA to DHA. So it has a shape more similar to an hourglass rather than having a, a rate limiting step, something of this shape. If we provide enough substrate, they, there will be production up to EPA, yeah, but that is the slowest of all the bioconversion and then become very quick, the production up to DHA. And again, few papers uh, where we address these issues. Another topic of interest was for us the competition between omega-3 and omega-6s, because as I mentioned before, these enzymes act on both fatty acids. So the idea is that if, of course, if we have a lot of omega-6, then there will be less enzyme available to operate and to bioconvert the omega-3 fatty acid. So what we did, for example, was a study where we provide the same abundant amount of omega-3 and then two diets, one with a lot of uh, omega-6 and one without any omega-6. Should there been an, a competition effect, we would have seen some difference in the production of EPA and DHA in the bioconversion of 18 3 and 3. But actually, the bioconversion of alpha linolenic to EPA and DHA was absolutely not affected by the amount of linoleic acid available, so the omega-6. And again, we can see not enough to understand what's happening, not enough that we can uh, use to fix the problem, but importantly, we prove that there is very little actual competition. And here a few papers addressing this uh, concept. At one point, I was very much interested, okay, we are talking about enzyme and enzyme needs cofactors and coenzyme too. How about we are maybe not providing enough of this uh, vitamin and minerals? And actually, this was a topic of an ASC discovery I got. And we tested different known 
cofactors and coenzyme for this. And what we show is that in trout, we had a little bit of improvement in the bioconversion if we over fortified with these uh, mineral and vitamins, but not in salmon, we couldn't see anything. What we clearly show is that if we don't provide enough of this cofactor and coenzyme, then the bioconversion is significantly compromised. But actually, all commercial feed, they provide an abundance of vitamins and minerals, and therefore that's not a limiting factor. So not enough to justify the poor performance of bioconversion of omega-3, but quite an interesting finding from a scientific point of view. So that was a dis discovery project and also some of the paper about this. So the question that I have now at one point is, why do fish not make enough long chain omega-3? And the answer is very simple. They don't make enough because they don't need it. Because they make enough for their own physiological need. The reality is that they, so in a way, they make enough for their own needs. They don't make enough for what we want. So the actual question I was working on was sort of wrong or misleading. And I had a moment where I said, I need to find a new scientific question direction to fix this problem, because the question I was asking myself was not the correct one. So I, I, at one point, I find myself in this situation where I was thinking, how can I transform what fish consider being enough into what we, consumer, want to be enough? So I said, OK, I can work on how to increase the total lipid content of the fish fillet, so more fat more omega-3 will be needed. I've been interested in looking at what are the relation with other nutrients, interactions of the long-chain omega-3 bioconversion, and how is that affected by other nutrients? Can we also optimize the omega-3 retention by sparing its catabolic process? Because some of this is burnt for energy. Can I spare this? And can I actually make sure that all the omega-3 that I put in a feed will end up in the fillet of the fish rather than other part of the fish which are not edible or burned for energy? So basically, I was trying to find a way to actually increase the needs of long-chain omega-3 for fish. And interestingly, I'll be very quick now here. I was looking at this point here, looking at interactions of other nutrients, and I think I stumbled about something interesting that can answer this question. So I present here a quick summary of a study I've done a few years ago. It's not yet published, I, and I have a manuscript ready for submission very soon. We were very much interested to understand the, what's happened in vivo to fish that were fed with a large amount of alpha-linolenic acid, the precursor, or large amount of the product, long chain. And I want to understand the bioconversion or the utilization efficiency of those two pool of omega-3, and how different fatty acids, not omega-3, all the other fatty acids will affect this metabolism. So I've designed an experiment with 12 diets. Six were rich in alpha-linolenic, six, six were rich in long-chain pool. And each diet was formulated to have a spike in a very specific fatty acid. So this diet, for example, has a spike in the fatty acid 12 with zero, and then a lot of alpha-linolenic. And we have another with 12 with zero and then a lot of long chain. And we have 14 with zero, 16 with zero, 18 with zero, 18 with nine, and we're to 18 with two. And quite complex. And I spent long hours to formulate this diet and to find all the available ingredients to do so. But I was very pleased with the final outcome of the diets. So here you can see the fatty acid composition of the 12 diets. The ALA diet, as you can see, they have the same amount of alpha linolenic acid. The long chain PUFA diet, they have the same amount of EPA and DHA. And then for the other diets, they all have similar amounts of each fatty acid with a single individual spike. So the idea was with an experiment of design like this, I should be able to understand the effect of these individual fatty acids. What oils I use, I use linseed and fish oil and a lot of other not really commercial oil. The most interesting was to find a source of 14 with zero. The only oil which is rich in this fatty acid was nutmeg oil. So I have to import this nutmeg oil directly from Mauritius. And these are the results of the growth trial. And as you can see, all fish perform very well in terms of low FCR, FCR below one, and good weight gain, with the exception of those fed nuts. 
Now, the problem is certainly is not a problem with 14 with zero as a fatty acid, but the very pungent and strong flavor of nutmeg butter. So I clearly discovered that fish don't like nutmeg, but that was unfortunate. I have to remove that treatment from the, from the subsequent analysis because those fish basically, they stop themselves rather than eating some nut. Here, the result of the composition of EPA and DHA in the fillet of those fish fed with those 12 diets. And as expected, those fed with alpha linoleic acid has less omega-3, long-chain omega-3 than those fed with already pre-made long-chain omega-3. What was interesting was I observed there was this trend. There was more long-chain omega-3 when we move from 12, 16 to 18 with zero, and then going down with 18, 1, 18, 2. Then I did some gene works looking at the expression rate of some key genes. And in some instances, I observed the same trend going up and down with that specific order of the diets, the treatment. So if I look then at the sterile regular element binding protein one, which is a key regulator for lipid metabolism, that trend was very strong. And so at this point, I had I was trying to understand what should I do with this data? What do they mean? And I actually resorted them rather than the original logical sequence I put them. I said, let's put them from the one with the highest response to the one with the lowest response. And I had this trend, 18, 16, 12 with zero, 18, one, and 18, two. And I was thinking, why is that? Clearly I could see an effect of the, pre the presence absence of the products, but I was interested to see this decrease the trend. So I start thinking about this fatty acid and what could justify this. At the one point I realized that was my Eureka moment that these fatty acids actually have a specific melting point. I said, okay, let's look at the melting point. So the fluidity of this fatty acid. And there you go. It was quite consistent going from 17 degree for 18 with zero to minus 11 for 18 two. So there is something amongst the omega-3 metabolism and the melting point or the fluidity of fatty acid. So I start running a lot of regression. I calculated a melting point of, there's a terrible mistake here. It's melting, not melting point. Apologies for that. Try to do all this regression to see if there was something happening. And what I found particularly interesting was not just on the genes, but actually on the enzyme activities. I look at the first step of the enzyme activity in fish fed alpha linoleic acid, and there was basically no regression relative to the melting point of the dietary fatty acids. But when I look at the second step, something was happening. The regression was start to appear. The following step for the production uh, of EPA, even better. And the further elongation, another elongation, and the eventual final delta six desaturation and the final chain shortening to the production of EPA, there was a clear and quite significant regression between the enzyme activity and the melting point of the other dietary fatty acids. With the fish fed the long chain omega-3, what I observed was that actually I was interested in the catabolism. So how much of the EPA and DHA I was giving to the fish was actually burned for energy. And I have the opposite trend. So how do I interpret this result? The melting point or the fluidity of the dietary lipids had, has an indirect effect on the biosynthesis of long chain and reduce the beta oxidation of long chain. And therefore, I think that independent of the form of omega-3 provided, there is something very important happening here with respect to the fluidity. We knew from before, from the study, that the ratio between product precursor is important. But I think that here I stand on something new, which is, I at the moment think, is all due to the need of fish for the maintenance of lipid fluidity. And let's remember that fish are cold-blooded animals. Salmon, they typically are at 10 degrees. Maintaining good fluidity of the membrane is absolutely paramount for them. Quite different compared to terrestrial animals like us. We live in an environment that is 37 degrees. And even... Saturated fat is quite fluid at that temperature, but when you are at 10 degree, you really need to maintain high fluidity of your membrane. So my hypothesis is that basically, if we provide a diet 
which in a way stress the fish. And in particular, I think what I want to look at next is the stress on the endoplasmatic reticulum. It will force the fish to make or to become more efficient in the metabolism of omega-3 because by having more omega-3, they can compensate for the less fluid fatty acid that has been provided in the duct. So that's where I am at. And I hope that from I can move forward with this research. So if there is anything, anybody in the audience that knows about endoplasmatic, endoplasmatic reticulum stress and how to measure that, please reach out. I would like to talk with you uh, because I think I, I want to keep going on exploring the, this option of basically increasing the need of fish to make more omega-3 fatty acids. And I close it here by acknowledging all collaborators, the new C lab, the nutrition and seafood laboratory that I've established at Deakin Uni. And now I would like sort of transition to a joint laboratory between Deakin and, and Melbourne. And all my colleagues and students, they, of course, they are extremely important for, for achieving these results. And here are some visual image of what working in aquaculture research looks like, complex system, and a lot of gas chromatography in my case. I spent long hours looking at chromatograms, but I also had a lot of fun. So on this note, John, I think I am 12.42, so I'm almost 14 minutes. I'm quite on time. I can stop here, and I'm happy to take any question. Um, great. Thank you, Gio. Um, really uh, good timing as well. So we have a um, bit of time for questions. So please put your questions in the Q&A and not in the chat. And I see there's a few there already. And I can ask people to um, ask their individual questions themselves. So questions in the Q&A, please. Um, Gio, can I start? And then I'll come to the ones that are already in the Q&A. And um, so there's a lot of fascinating um, material there. But one of the things that the work seems to be predicated on is the concept that we as humans need, I think it was 500 milligrams per day of uh, long chain omega-3 fatty acids. And um, so I just wonder where that comes from, because as, as humans, some of us wouldn't have eaten fish, I'm assuming, in our diets. And I'm wondering whether apes, for example, eat fish. And, um, you know, do we actually need 500 milligrams of omega-3 yeah. fatty acid in our diets or somebody's yeah. just come up with that number? Thanks, John. No, I mean, that, that, that's actually a very good point. The 500 milligrams of EPA and DHA in the diet is not an essential nutrient requirement. It is a recommended dietary intake based on a series of observations that those long chain omega-3 provide a health benefit. However, there's plenty of humans being, they've been living all their life without eating a single gram of it, like vegetarian, particularly if you think of the sub Indian subcontinent where there are a lot of vegetarian, they've been living for generation and generation without eating any seafood at all, any omega-3 because they can only be found in fish and a little bit in, in terrestrial product. So they are not required. They are beneficial yeah. and they are particularly beneficial for Westerner, which eat an imbalanced diet. So once we eat a lot saturated, a lot of omega-6 and we smoke, we drink alcohol and we have all our problems and a lot of car simple carbohydrates, then that's where long-chain omega-3 become extremely beneficial because they are anti-inflammatory and they can balance a lot of things. But a healthy vegetarian diet, you don't actually need it. Okay, thanks, Joe. I remember some years back when I was uh, working on multiple sclerosis and um, a lot of people were saying you need to take omega-3 um, fish oils for multiple sclerosis. And I don't think, I'm not sure that's ever really panned out well. Um, Okay, let me go to the questions that are online and um, maybe start with Richard's, he was first. Um, Richard, do you want to ask your question? Uh, Gio, thanks for your talk. Um, it, it, it might be a little tangential, so forgive me if it's, if it's a, a bad question, but um, in our enteric methane research, we, we tried a whole lot of oils uh, from C12 through to C18s, and they all seem to work equally in reducing enteric methane in ruminants. And then we thought we'd get smart and try the C20s and C22s and 24s, um, EPA and DHA, essentially, um, and found absolutely no effect. Is there any specific property of these oils you could point to as to why all the C12 to C18 seem to have an effect, which seems to be 
uh, not just uh, biohydrogenation, it seemed to actually be an effective physical coating on protozoa, preventing hydrogen transfer to methanogens. Um, uh, I mean, as I said, it could be a completely unfair question, but if there's any specific property you know of that might have meant that the longer chains really didn't have the same property, uh, anything you can think of? Yeah, thanks, Richard. That's a very interesting question. And yeah, it's a little bit off uh, left field compared to my knowledge. But I guess one of the characteristic of those saturated fatty acids or 12 to 18 that you have seen, so the less fluid one, is that they actually are poorly digestible. So they are less digested and they stay longer in the intestine, if you like. And that may have an effect. While long chain omega-3, like EPA and DHA, they are very highly digestible and they will be taken up immediately in the, in the bloodstream quite quickly. So that might explain it or maybe not, but I will look into those aspects in terms of digestibility when it comes to the possible effect on methanogenesis or ruminants. Thank you. Residence time in the rumen would be a big impact, so that could actually explain a lot. Great, excellent. That's, um, that's a great start. Um, Robin, would you like to um, ask your question? Go yes, ahead, Robin, you're on. Yep, we can hear you. Yep, good. Hi, um, Giovanni. Thank you very much for your presentation. I enjoyed it. Uh, Gio, uh, one of our colleagues in Kemin just talked about getting some of these omega-3 fatty acids from, um, he's been working on algae. Um, I, didn't, I didn't see algae uh, mentioned. Maybe I missed it in your talk, but it might be a good opportunity for you to meet him at some stage and see how we could collaborate with him, actually. Yeah, no, I, I did mention them when I referred to the single cell oil. Those are. Oh, yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah, no worries about that. But yeah, there is a lot of activity, and that's possibly one of the most viable source, and that will be very well accepted by consumers. So basically, we can farm these unicellular algae, which are extremely rich in omega 3, and we can actually tailor the fatty acid composition of this algae and can be harvested. The problem has always been the cost of production. So until a few years ago, the resulting oil was so expensive that it was not even logical to think about it. But the technology had developed to the point that now this oil start getting to a market price, which is of interest for the industry, directly right. for, to be used for food, uh, for, for fish, but can also be used directly as an alternative to fish oil tablets supplement for humans. Thanks for that, Gio. Geo, just on the um, on these long chain fatty acids, can you make them in a petrochemical plant? Can you make EPA and DHA just in um, you know in some big oil refinery or some by yep. byproducts uh, of some oil refinery? You know, I ask that question multiple times every time because, like most of the nutrients, they can be synthetically done. And the answer I got from the expert is that yes, we can make it, but they will cost you a fortune because it's extremely complicated. And in fact, they do it for chemical standards, but there is no way to do it in a simple, cheap way. The best way to do it is using microalgae, if you like, using them as a fermenter. Okay, um, Neil Mann had a few questions and one of them might be on that particular issue, a continuation of that question. Neil, do you want to come in? Well, my first question, G, I think uh, Robin touched on it and you partly answered it about the algal fermentation process. Uh, Martek have been doing that, as you probably know, for the vegan uh, uh, people who wanted non-animal sources, BPA and DHA. So my question was basically saying, will it become commercially acceptable uh, cost-wise? And uh, also, uh, will the use of GM canola, the, the, the type of product developed by Ellen Green and ECSIRO group in Canberra uh, with its EPA and DHA, will that, will that become a suitable uh, feed source for aquaculture or is the cost going to be too great or is the uh, uh, GM label on it still a major problem? Um, yep. My third one, uh, in the late 1980s, you might have uh, realised David Horriban uh, with the Scotia Pharmaceutical Group was producing, uh, I think, the first available human fish oil, Max Epo. Now, they were doing that in, in a very constructive way by uh, taking the fish that was being processed on the Hebridean Islands, Harris and Lewis, uh, that was marketed 
uh, to the British population as fish fillets and so on. They were taking the heads and tails and offal and so on and uh, processing it uh, or extracting the uh, oils from it, EPA and DHA. Uh, I haven't heard much about that uh, for many years. I was there in the 80s when they did this, but I just wonder if this is still a way uh, ahead to use those fish off parts. Okay, thanks, Neil. Uh, I, I, I think not, likely, because three questions. So the first one about the vegan EPA and DHA, they are commercial. Yes, they are commercial available, as I mentioned. Actually, both for human consumption. The brand is actually Opt3. If you are interested, you can buy them. Uh, and also, it's commercially viable now for aquaculture, so for, for fish food. They're still very expensive compared to fish oil, but because they can, they, the feed company can sell a nice story about using algae oil, it's sustainable and so forth, they can afford to use that. And they sell that at the premium price. So it's top premium food is not that the one food used for the big production of aquaculture. For genetically modified canola, there is a technicality issue is that that oil contains fundamentally a lot of DHA and very little EPA. And many in the industry are worried about that because they think the fish need EPA. I've done a lot of work together with other colleagues around the world. They say, no, fish don't need EPA. Fish needs just DHA. Yeah. But apart from that, they are ready to come to the market. There's been a lot of market analysis done. Consumers apparently are happy to, for fish to eat genetically modified oils. They maybe don't want to eat directly them, but they are okay to have like a, a step in between the genetically modified food and what they eat. The problem at the moment is the cost. Of course, those companies that invest a large amount of money to develop these genetically modified products want to have a benefit out of that. What they do at the moment is selling at a price which is higher than fish oil and very small quantity. And most big companies say, well, it's higher, the consumer might not like it and therefore it's not really getting traction. I imagine at one point they will have to change direction and when they actually start selling at a more reasonable price and need to be cheaper than fish oil, then it could become quite important and significant. And the last question was about, let's say the byproduct oil that is happening. And so when we talk fish oil, there's a, a good part of that is actually is coming from byproducts. So all the leftover from the filleting industry that can be uh, harvested and ex the oil extracted. The tuna oil, for example, it's so as tuna oil is all coming from the offal of the tuna and actually is the one that goes into the baby food. And then this, the largest source of DHA for, for the formula is coming from concentrated tuna byproduct oil, if you like. So the, it is a growing area. It's the last few years uh, attract a lot of uh, attraction. One of the problem of byproducts is a geographical distribution. Typically, you don't have large volume all in one place. Where you have large volume of byproducts, very large um, processor, then you can think about harvesting them, converting to fish meal and fish oil. But there's a lot of fish which is actually is uh, processed in a very much scattered way, and therefore that is a difficult situation to harvest those fish and convert them into fish oil or fish meat. Hope I answered your question, Neil. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, next, we've got Said. Um, Saeed, would you like to ask your question? Yes, uh, thank you, Jaya. My question, you explained a lot about using fat-rich diet and the impact on the production of, of omega-3. Has there been any attempt to study the impact of protein-rich diet, like using single-cell protein from Saccharomyces cerevisiae, for example, which can be generated very cheaply, to feed these fish and see the impact on the production of omega-3. Which protein, sorry, Saida, which protein are you referring to? Single cell protein harvested yeah. from uh, yeast. Yeah, okay, sorry, yeah, got it. Yes, I mean, there's a massive amount of research currently done and on the protein side, on the fish meal equation of the, of the problem. So the problem is twofold here. We have the use of wild fish for making fish meal, protein source, fish oil, lipid source. What I presented was just about the oil and a small part of the current work. The fish meal and the protein represent, I haven't addressed that. That will open to a much longer debate. 
and discussion. Single cell protein are being used, yes, and as well as many other alternative proteins. Let's say, generally speaking, any kind of proteins can very, it's relatively easy to replace fish meal in the diet, as long as you have a protein with a decent amino acid profile and with, which has no terrible palatability effect for the fish. So there's a lot of alternative option. Single cell protein, uh, pro protein originated from single cell organisms have been used. Yeast has been used for many years. So it's all about the, yeah, the nutritional composition and the cost of production. But they have been investigated in terms of their impact on omega-3 production. Very little, but that's the word. And actually one day I, I wrote a paper about that in, in a conference, actually did a presentation about the fact that the, the fish nutritionists are splitting two silos. There are those working on protein, those working on lipids, and they don't talk to each other. And, and there's a lot of miss opportunity there because typically those working on protein just look at the protein and production. And mm. so there's been little formal work done. Personally, I don't think there could be massive effect there because as you know, proteins are simply digested and once they go into this bloodstream, doesn't matter where they come from, it's just amino acid. So I don't imagine there could be major effect on the lipid metabolism unless there are some bioactive peptides that could be a different stories. And that's open to another area of research. There's a lot of research currently done on bioactives. Thank you. Okay, talking about palatability um, for the fish, Anita's got a, an interesting um, thought for you. Anita. Oh yeah, thank you. It was a really interesting presentation. Um, I think you said that um, the fish fed nutmeg butter um, stopped eating. Is that, is that what you said? Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, I was just wondering if, if that might be explained because nutmeg's known to have psychoactive effects, sort of hallucinogenic effects. <laughs> I was wondering if your fish, that's why they stopped eating. Okay, that's usually, I did not know that. I thought it was just the smell. I actually quite like the smell of nutmeg butter and I still have some, so I need to tell a Dickin to lock it if it has these side effects. <laughs> and I, I, I don't think so. I actually, I, I actually think that there was something because it was not purified, it was a nutmeg butter. So it was not just the fatty acid protein with zero, but there were some volatile and I imagine some water soluble components there and fish, they were really, really not even trying to eat them. So, and that was even before putting the pellet in their mouth. They, they really oh, so was, before they even ate it, so it's not Yeah, so okay. they, they took a long time and after a point they were so, we were monitoring them also for welfare point of view, of course. At one point they start eating a little bit, but the first reaction was basically when we throw the first pellet in, they say, no, I'm not gonna eat that. So I don't think it's linked with any psychoactive things because otherwise I would imagine they normally start eating and then maybe they change their behavior. But in this yeah. case, the behavior was before they actually consume it. Thanks. Okay, so last question now. We're back to human health, and uh, Georgi has a question for you. Georgi? Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Yep, hear you. Oh, fine. good. Yeah, thanks, Giovanni, for that really interesting talk. Look, yeah, my question is just around the, in terms of the health benefits or otherwise of supplements versus eating the fish oil in the form of fish or in plants and, and so on. Um, and because I, I believe, well, first of all, I think you made the point that. Most of our fish oil is going to be going towards the production of supplements for humans. I might have misheard, misheard that at the start. The start, anyway, a substantial amount. But I believe that I mean the the sort of systematic reviews that have been done. I think there was one done by Cochrane about the claimed health benefits of omega threes. Really brought that into question whether that that evidence holds up. And if that's the case, is this, are we wasting a lot of fish oil if it's going into supplements and people are thinking that they're and I guess it's versus getting them directly from foods. Yeah, you know, that's a, I mean, there's been a lot of debate about this and every three, four years, there is a paper coming out discrediting fish oil as a supplement for human. There are a series of interests behind this. I actually believe there's something to do with the fact that you can't prescri prescribe fish oil and therefore you can't really make much money out of that. So it's very simple to say it's not effective, but quite interesting, there is one drug 
company, Amarcode, which is actually fundamentally fish oil, and that is prescribed by the USDA. And everybody said that that is very good and very good for our health, why fish oil is not. So I would not look too much into the negative paper coming out discrediting fish oil, because once you get one of them, you also get another hundreds, maybe more, saying the importance of omega-3 and how beneficial they are. Having said that, I actually believe that is much more healthy and effective to consume omega-3 together with the fish by you consuming the fish and not just the supplement. Also because when you eat the fish, you have a lot of other beneficial things together with omega-3. You get the best possible amino acid composition you can get, you get a lot of trace element and so forth. And most importantly, you don't eat those bad food that actually create problems. So instead, if you eat junk food all day and then you take a couple of tablets of fish oil, it doesn't really fix the problems. So yeah. it's quite complex, Gary. We might like to talk about this. Off yeah, the line. I think. I mean, that's that's my hunch too. It's the whole food matrix that's important, and having it together. As a sep- but I'm also interested to hear hear those um, those comments of yours about the potential commercial conflicts of interest in the in the re- research, which is also something I study. In fact, and it's always it's often there in the background. So it's important to look at who's publishing those studies and who's funding those studies. Indeed. Thank you. Thanks, Yogi. Okay, well, that brings us to the end of uh, the seminar. And I'd like to thank uh, Giovanni for that, for a really interesting and um, thought-provoking discussion. I'm going to think a little bit more about the fish that I eat from now on. And uh, um, so let me just run through to what will be next presentation. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank you all for attending today's presentation. And I hope you'll join me next time, which will be on the 12th of July for the next Dean's Research Seminar, where Professor Mohan Singh will present his research on biodesign strategies for creating the crops for the future. So I hope to see you all then. Thank you.